Hello everybody. Today I am going to talk to you about a lot of topics that are very important for not only IGNU PhD entrance but in many many exams in NET also. These topics in IGNU PhD entrance are very major topics in contemporary MA studies, in postgraduate studies, in research. So I hope you will benefit from it. We should not think very narrowly and think only this I will study, all this is not necessary for NET. Like that you should never think because that is why NET people are asking more and more new, new areas. They are asking new questions. Na? So never think narrowly. We have to study everything. Are, the other day also I, we had the same color. Na? I don't like same color every time. While we wait for a few people to come, let us change the color. Ayyo. Ayyo. Which color do you like? This is okay. Green. Ignu green. Okay. <laughs> All right. So shall we start? Today I will do PhD entrance. Tomorrow I will do MA entrance. Okay. This month we are going to do major exams series. First and foremost, we'll talk about subaltern studies. Subaltern studies is a very important area in net, set, and many exams. Okay, so uh, let us talk about subaltern studies. Subaltern studies is a particular group in India. As all of you know, subaltern studies is a group in India which emerged in 1982. Ranajit Guha, Partha Chatterjee, Shahid Amin, so many important figures, you might know them, right? They emerged in 1982. First, they came as a series of journal articles. First, the subaltern studies group, uh, they started publishing journal articles. That is how they came first. And they were published by Oxford University Press in India. And uh, the editor was Ranajit Guha. Ranajit Guha, the leader of subaltern studies, led the subaltern studies scholars to write a series of journal articles. And it started a very new group in itself. It is... Uh, an ideological group that sought to take a new look at history. They wanted to take a new look at history. Will you remember? So, he was the prime mover and the ideologue of the project. Subaltern is a term that draws from Antonio Gramsci. Don't you know that? Subaltern is a term that draws from Antonio Gramsci. And Gramsci talked about subaltern, the term, in the context of the military. The lower ranks of the military were called the subaltern. And then what happened? The theory of Gramsci or the idea of Gramsci is that history should be written from the point of view of the subaltern. History should be written from the point of view of the subaltern. And the bottom most rank of people, subaltern means the bottom most rank of people. And then what happens? Uh, subaltern history will overturn mainstream history. Subaltern history is completely different from mainstream history. Mainstream history talks only about powerful people. Subaltern studies wanted to write history from the point of view of the subaltern or the bottom most rank of people in the society. What is subaltern studies? It's adherence. Adherence means the theorists of subaltern studies proclaimed that it is a new school. Subaltern studies, they said, is a new school in the field of Indian uh, history writing. 
in the field of Indian historiography. Subaltern studies is a new group, a new school, and they declared it to be a break in the tradition of Indian historiography. Indian historiography is always about powerful people, upper caste people. Subaltern studies wanted to break with Indian history and write history from the point of view of the subaltern. Subaltern studies refers to the study of social groups excluded from dominant power structures. Dominant power structures of history are there. History is about powerful people, rich people, upper caste people. And many groups are excluded from such a history. Many groups are not even included in history at that time. Only dominant people are there in history. So, subaltern studies talks about reclaiming history of the silenced margins. It may be neo-colonial, socio-economic, patriarchal, linguistic, cultural, racial domination. So many kinds of domination. Sometimes the domination of the new colonizers. Sometimes the domination of the socio-economically powerful people. Sometimes the domination of patriarchy. Sometimes the domination of the uh, people who speak main language. Whatever it is, domination is there. Many people are silenced and marginalized. Subaltern studies wanted to revive the alternate histories, the hidden histories. Did you understand? Yes, Deepsa is asking. Spivak's famous essay. Spivak was also involved in subaltern studies. As I told you already, Partha Chatterjee, uh, Renajit Guha, Deepesh Chakravarti, uh, Shahid Amin, they are the main figures. Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak was also included in subaltern studies. She was very uh, appreciative of their work. She joined with them. But then very uh, academically she asked a question. If these theorists keep talking about subaltern studies, will the subaltern will ever be able to speak? Will the subaltern people ever be able to speak if other people keep talking about them? So that actually was an academic question. She did not mean that a subaltern studies group is bad or they are not doing their work properly or anything. But uh, this question became very controversial. This essay became very controversial. 1988 essay. And later she retracted her ideas. She revised her ideas. Okay. Now what are the main concerns of subaltern studies? Let us see what are the main concerns of subaltern studies. First, they talk about the archaic or the old primitive in the modern. In contemporary times, in modern society, what is the role of the archaic? What is the role of the ancient primitive? What is the role of the archaic in modern? That is one theme in subaltern studies. So they trace the ancient um, elements of culture in modern cultures. Secondly, what is the subject of history? Second theme in subaltern studies is, what is history? What is the subject of history? Is history talking about everybody? Is there anybody, is there any kind of history that deals with everybody in the society? Or is history only about some people? That is the theme of uh, subaltern history. Subaltern historiography they started. They questioned history. Did you understand? And what did subaltern studies group do? Subaltern studies group focused on peasant uprisings, mass uprisings, rebellions. Ordinary peasants, mass, mass community, many times they rose in rebellion. In history, many times mass uprisings and rebellions were there. These subaltern historiographers focused on these rebellions and mass uprisings. Tried to prove the existence of an um, autonomous domain uh, subaltern subjectivity. In the autonomous domain, there is a subaltern subjectivity. 
you know, beyond our mainstream history, there is a subaltern subjectivity. Subaltern mind is there. Subaltern thinking is there. Remember, this is based on cultural studies. In cultural studies in CCCS, the main figures, Richard Hogarth, E.P. Thompson, Raymond Williams, what were they doing? They were looking at working class culture in England. Like that, Ranajit Guha, Partha Chatterjee, etc. are looking at subaltern culture in India. There is a similarity. And what are the subaltern studies people doing? Tracing the systems of silencing and oppression. How is silencing happening in India? In Indian history, how is silencing happening? How are some people silenced? Only some people find voice. Some people are silenced. Why? They are thinking. How is oppression happening? They look at the mechanisms of silencing and oppression. They, they, sorry, you can't read it. Eh? I will change it. I will change it. They look at the binary relationship of the subaltern and the ruling classes. On the one hand, the working class or the subaltern. On the other hand, the ruling classes. Ruling classes are powerful. The subaltern people are beaten by the ruling class, isn't it? The ruling class, how do they oppress the subaltern? They look at the binary relationship between subaltern and ruling classes. And they study the interplay of dominance and subordination in colonial systems. How dominance is happening, subordination is happening, dominance, subordination and how resistance. This conflict is what subaltern studies is about. Subaltern studies talks about the interplay of dominance of the ruling classes, subordination of the uh, subaltern classes. Did you understand everybody? Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me. Because I was teaching in an excited manner. I did not say hello. Hello, I am fine. We have started our classes today. I am fully engaged. I am happy. Okay. So, did you like the session? I uh, designed the session so that it will help everybody. Not only people who are writing IGNU PhD entrance, but everybody. It is helping you, isn't it? Wonderful. Now, Subaltern studies has two phases that is very famous, okay? In NET also they will ask. Subaltern studies has two phases. Phase one consists of concern with the lower classes, the exploited lower classes. That is phase one. Phase one talks about the uh, subordinate lower classes. They criticize the elite or the exploiting classes. Ruling classes are exploiting the uh, lower classes. So the ruling classes are criticized. The subaltern lower classes are studied. Clear? Subaltern studies is influenced by Gramscian thought. I told you Antonio Gramsci's thinking or writing influenced subaltern studies. They are therefore Marxist. Antonio Gramsci is a Marxist, remember? Antonio Gramsci is a Marxist. Subaltern studies talks about Marxist social history and an attempt to work within broader Marxist theory. They incorporate ideas of Marxism into subaltern studies. So, postcolonialism, Marxism, both are combined in subaltern studies. There are writings of Ranajit Guha, Shahid Amin, Gyan Pandey, Stephen Henningham, David Hardiman, Sumit Sarkar. What you should do if you are writing Igno Endrance, if you are going to write Igno uh, PhD Endrance on 24th, isn't it? Then what you should do, you should look up all these writers. Ranajit Guha writings, what are his ideas, Shahid Amin's ideas, Gyanendra Pandey's ideas. Like that, do a little bit of extra research. Then you will be able to write awesome essays in the exam. Okay, with all this basis that we have, you will be able to write. In the coming days, look up all these writers. Will you do that, guys? Now, in phase one, what did we have? They are talking about subaltern and ruling classes. In phase two, what are they having? In the second phase, there is a clear shift from these concerns. From these concerns, they are shifting, changing. Then 
there is an increasing engagement with textual analysis. So I will mark here, okay, so that you will remember. There is an increasing engagement with textual analysis. A shift away from history of the, uh, history written by upper classes. History of the uh, exploited people uh, and more engagement with elite discourses. They criticize elite discourses. Instead of talking about exploited people's history, they talk about how elite discourses uh, construct the subaltern. Marx and Gramsci are jettisoned. The second phase is not Marxist. More they deal, they turn to Michel Foucault and Edward Said. Marx and Gramsci are jettisoned. Michel Foucault and Edward Said are followed. In the second phase. The second phase includes writings of Partha Chatterjee, Gautam Bhadra, Gyan Prakash, Deepesh Chakrabarti. Will you remember? Influence of postmodernism, post colonialism, early subaltern studies group included Marxism. You know, no, exam is uh, descriptive, and uh, um, IGNU entrance is descriptive, isn't it? I saw the ex previous um, question paper, etc. It's descriptive, isn't it? Now, uh, in the early phase of subaltern studies, uh, there was increased Marxist approach. In the later phase, there is postmodernist and postcolonial approach. Did you understand? Now, I have given a very big list of the subaltern studies scholars. You have to Look up these writers, their major works, etc. Uh, this time it is objective. Even then, same thing. Whether it is objective or descriptive, no change. All these things they will ask. They are all very important in NET also. Anytime they will ask Deepesh Chakravarti, Partha Chatterjee. So, these are very major subaltern studies scholars who have written extremely important, uh, um, you know, books. Sometimes about nationalism, sometimes about peasants, sometimes about cultural studies, like that, different, different angles. Okay, so uh, what is this I mean? Is there any single day I did not send PDF? Again, again, why do you ask? Every single day I send PDF, no? So subaltern study scholars, one by one, you should take up, do research, okay, before the exam, because they will ask you about all these authors and their works. Now, subaltern studies has been criticized also. People have criticized the subaltern studies. Very famous, uh, Sumit Sarkar. Sumit Sarkar was a subaltern studies scholar, but later he critiqued the subaltern studies. Did you understand? Uh, subaltern studies uh, Sumit Sarkar was a member, but later he criticized the subaltern studies. Decline of the subaltern in subaltern studies. That is a very famous essay where he criticized the turn to Foucauldian studies. He criticized the subaltern studies for turning to power knowledge Foucauldian studies, leaving behind their empiricist and Marxist efforts. They started with empiricist and Marxist efforts, but then they uh, changed over to, uh, you know, subaltern, sorry, um, Foucauldian studies. Clear? Indian sociologist Vivek Chibber, remember Vivek Chibber has criticized the premise of subaltern studies in the book, very famous book, Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of the Capital. Will you remember? Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of the Capital. He, he critiqued works of Ranajit Guha, Deepesh Chakrabarti, etc. So that is subaltern studies criticism. That is criticism of subaltern studies. The next concept in PhD entrance is multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is also a very important concept for net and set and many exams. So remember, these are very, very important topics. Uh, now, the branch of political philosophy... Multiculturalism is the branch of political philosophy that explores the relation between cultural diversity and human freedom. Cultural diversity. When a society is diverse, 
how free can human beings be is diversity about freedom or against it is diversity against well being or about it did you understand in in multicultural theory multiculturalism is a theory it is a branch of philosophy and it is a literary theory they offer justifications for accommodating the claims of cultural minorities minority people don't have any voice usually but according to multiculturalism minority people are gaining voice minor minority people are accommodated into legal and political institutions and public policies did you understand minority people uneducated people powerless people the lowest rungs of the society those people are all incorporated into legal and political institutions according to multicultural theory clear everybody should find voice and space the existence of difference and even power relations among populations look at america america is a multicultural society so many different cultures live in america there are many races many ethnicities many religions many geographic distinctions like india also in india also it is like that so how do all of them interact what is the power struggle between all these people how do they deviate from the norm what is normal is defined and many of these marginal people will deviate from the normal all this is studied in multiculturalism did you understand everyone multiculturalism aims to minimize discrimination of minority minority cultural communities should be discriminate discriminated minimum everybody should be equal minorities should not be discriminated that is the theme in um, multiculturalism multiculturalism tries to minimize minority cultural communities discrimination and to promote non discrimination the uh, multiculturalist theorists want to promote non discrimination synonyms of multiculturalism there are some synonyms ethnic pluralism cultural pluralism have you heard these terms they are same as multiculturalism cultural plurality cultural pluralism ethnic pluralism all very important terms you should study when i i am just introducing major concepts you should read extra about all this a little more research on your own before the exam okay ancient societies like the achaemenid empire founded by cyrus the great followed a policy of incorporating and tolerating various cultures see multiculturalism was there in ancient societies it seems how multiculturalism existed in ancient societies uh, and how is it related to contemporary societies all that is studied by multicultural theorists multiculturalism is the key to achieving high degree of cultural diversity today a very important virtue every community wants this what cultural diversity that means many cultures should coexist hai na there should be no fighting there should be tolerance there should be sharing so how to achieve cultural diversity that is a main issue in all societies multiculturalism as a theory gives us valuable insights multiculturalism teaches us how you can have a cultural diversity here homi baba arjuna padre so many people have written about it diversity occurs when people of different races different nationalities different religions ethnicities philosophies all come together like a community look at our youtube community you are all from different different places you have different exams different requirements but we are all together learning same things isn't it we are example for multiculturalism isn't it a truly diverse society is one that recognizes and values the cultural differences in its people a truly diverse society where cultural diversity is there is one that recognizes cultural differences 
values cultural differences homi baba has famously written about differences and diversity these two terms he has talked about he said difference is important now listen to me guys there is something very important called multicultural education multicultural education is very important it is a modern teaching model that aims to foster principles of equity amongst all students multicultural education aims to foster principles of equity equality or equity among students despite their varied cultures people students have in in america for example students have in in one classroom students will have different community different culture different beliefs different backgrounds hena how do you foster an equality among them that is multicultural education it is an effective form of education that integrates values histories viewpoints of all student groups in a class all the diverse student groups all should have same kind of education and how will you integrate their diverse attitudes and beliefs that is multicultural education very important figure is james banks will you remember in multicultural education important theorist is james banks one of the most famous researchers in the field of multicultural education he said there are four approaches in multicultural education what is, one is contributions approach you have to contribute you know people from diverse communities contribute then the additive approach you have to keep on adding more and more values transformation approach that means society changes transforms completely social action approach in multicultural education it might lead to social action that means real action will result from multicultural education society will change because of that social action james banks talks about four approaches in multicultural education did you understand now multiculturalism is the way in which a society deals with cultural diversity not only at national level but also community level at national level at community level both multiculturalism is important sociologically multiculturalism assumes that society as a whole benefits from increased diversity society as a whole uh benefits from diversity it is good that we are diverse we are all uh de de you know developing because of it did you understand harmonious coexistence of different cultures multiculturalism typically develops according to two theories do you know melting pot theory of america salad bowl theory of canada melting pot theory in america salad bowl theory in canada now multiculturalism privileges the good of certain groups over common good before i talk about melting pot and salad bowl i will tell you the challenges to multiculturalism then we'll talk about the two theories multiculturalism privileges the good of certain groups uh over common good even though multiculturalism claims equality multiculturalism says that everybody should be equal but actually in multiculturalism some groups become more privileged over others that is one criticism clear everybody there is no equality actually in multiculturalism national unity could become impossible if people see themselves as members of ethnic community for example when i was living in canada i saw that many people in canada canadian citizens do not know canadian national anthem they don't know uh, many facts about canada because they think about themselves as still indians or japanese or chinese or scandinavians they are not thinking as canadians so in multiculturalism when you let everybody be diverse the problem is that national identity will be affected sometimes national unity becomes impossible because people will still think of themselves uh, in terms of their home culture 
Did you understand? When Indians emigrate to Canada, they think of themselves as Indians. When Japanese people emigrate to Canada, they think of themselves as Japanese. So, how is national unity possible? That is one challenge to multiculturalism. Clear everybody? Multiculturalism. Also, third point, they go, undermines the notion of equal individual rights. You know, equal individual rights will not be there um, in multiculturalism. Is one challenge to multiculturalism. You know, um, it weakens the notion of individual rights. You know, because the community becomes more important than the individual. The sub-communities of a nation become more important than the individuals. For example, I will explain. Uh, in Canada, people are not treated as individuals, but they are treated as Scandinavians, Japanese, Indians, like that. So the problem is, what happens to the individual? His own little community takes over. Did you understand? That is the problem. Now, equal individual rights could be set aside or deprecated in favor of rights of the group. So, within one nation, there are many groups. The group becomes dominant over the individual. That is one challenge to multiculturalism. Clear? I hope it is clear. Now I will tell you what is melting pot theory of America. Sorry. Melting pot theory is in America. That means everybody who comes to America becomes American. They lose their individual values, individual characteristics of their ethnic group. For example, in Streetcar Named Desire, Stanley Kowalski does not want to be remembered as a po Polish man. He doesn't want to be remembered as a po uh, to be referred to as a Pole. He wants to be American. That is melting pot theory. Salad bowl theory means that in Canada they don't want to remain. They don't want to be Amer they, they don't want to be Canadian. They want to retain their original identity. They want to be known as Pole, Polish people than Canadians. Did you understand? The melting pot theory of multiculturalism assumes that various immigrant groups will melt together, abandon their individual cultures and become fully assimilated into the main society. Did you understand? The melting pot theory means Indians will go to America, Japanese will go to America, Scandinavians will go to America. They will all become American. They will forget that they are Japanese or Indians or Scandinavians. The melting pot model reduces diversity, causing people to lose their traditions. Did you understand? People will lose their traditions in mel melting pot theory. Whereas in salad bowl theory, it is a more liberal approach to multiculturalism. All the groups will retain their values. All the uh, subgroups sub will retain their original cultures and values. Like in a salad bowl. Like a salad's ingredients, the different cultures are all brought together, but they remain heterogeneous. They do not become one homogeneous culture. Rather, they become, they remain heterogeneous. Did you understand everybody? On the negative side, in salad bowl theory, uh, the nation can be divided because of salad bowl multiculturalism. The nation can be divided because of salad bowl multiculturalism. Unity will not be there. In melting pot culture, unity will be there. But, Original values, traditions, etc., they will lose. Here, they will retain original values, but unity, national unity will not be there. Did you understand everyone? Now, have you liked the video, guys? You are all very quiet. Tell me, talk to me. Now, who are the major theorists and scholars of multiculturalism? Major theorists and scholars of multiculturalism. Have you heard of Robert Putnam? He wrote a controversial publication called Bowling Alone, which argues that United States has undergone 
an unprecedented collapse in civic, social, political life, etc., with serious negative consequences. Robert Putnam is criticizing multiculturalism. Have you heard of Miguel de la Torre? Miguel de la Torre, he argued that the melting pot theory of immigration is a lie. You say that all different cultures melt into one culture, but it is a lie. Immigrants are not equal in America. Miguel de la Torre is criticizing American multiculturalism. Have you heard of Will Kimlika? Will Kimlika, he developed the most influential liberal theory of multiculturalism. Will Kimlika developed the most influential liberal theory of multiculturalism by combining liberal values of autonomy, liberal values of autonomy and equality. He took the theories of autonomy, equality, combined them with the idea of cultural membership. That means what I will explain. People should be liberal. People should be autonomous and equal. But they should also belong to the culture. There should be cultural membership. Individuality. <clears throat> autonomy should be there. But at the same time, they should have cultural membership. Have you heard of Bhikkhu Parekh? He wrote Rethinking Multiculturalism. These are all very important theorists of multiculturalism. Okay? Are you enjoying? Am I boring you? I am telling you major themes, major ideas. Okay? For every exam, this is important. NTA net, set, uh, entrance exams, whether you are writing MA entrance or everywhere, you will know, need to know something about all this. Read extra. Then, in PhD entrance of IGNU, you need new literatures in English. New literatures in English, Caribbean literature. V.S. Naipaul. V.S. Naipaul wrote post-colonial, post-modern novels. V.S. <coughs> Naipaul's novels are comic novels. V.S. Naipaul is a Caribbean writer who got Nobel Prize and also... Uh, Booker Prize, V.S. Naipaul. What are the concerns of V.S. Naipaul's novels? Very famous are Mimic Men, A House for Mr. Viswas. V.S. Naipaul has written Miguel Street. In all these works, he looks at ordinary middle class people of the Caribbean islands. How they are all petty people. Some of them are criminals. Some, none of them are so heroic. They are all ordinary people. They are not heroic. And he is in a mocking way looking at life and its absurdities. That in, he writes a lot of post-colonial themes. Identity crisis. That means you cannot have a complete identity as a post-colonial subject. Post-colonial people are divided. They are forced to do things in order to survive. In order to survive, the post-colonial subjects have to engage in very uh, wrong things sometimes, petty things sometimes. That is what V.S. Naipaul writes like. And then Derek Walcott. Derek Walcott is uh, prescribed in universities a lot. He is also a very important um, you know, post-colonial writer, the first Caribbean writer to win Nobel Prize and he's a poet and playwright. His poems are prescribed. I have talked about Derek Walcott's poems in 10 p.m. live many times. His poems are very important and uh, you should read and know about A Far Cry from Africa, The Sea's History, Mass Man, Adam's Song, so many prescribed poems are there. And also Derek Walcott wrote plays like A Dream on Monkey Mountain. That is his most famous play. Pantomime based on uh, Robinson Crusoe, etc. Derek Walcott also talks about, uh, you know, violence of history, lack of identity, connection with Africa, 
then uh, how post-colonial subjects are always wandering and history is oppressing them. These themes are so common in Derek Walcott. Edward Kamau Brathwaite is another important uh, Caribbean writer. E.K. Brathwaite wrote in nation language. He used a totally new kind of language to write. It is, called, it is a Creole language. Uh, he wrote in Creole languages and uh, language and called it nation language. He was a folklorist and he has written about history. He has written about immigration, the slavery of uh, the past and such so many violent traumas of post-colonial history. He has written about Edward Kamau Brathwaite. Then in African literature, many important figures. I have just taken the people who are prescribed in uh, Ignu, but there might be questions from other writers also. We have dealt with new literature several times already in 10 p.m. life. Ngugi Vationgo is not only a novelist, he also wrote uh, plays and also non-fiction. As all of you know, he is Kenyan and he wrote in English at first. He gave up English, he rejected English and then started writing in Gikuyu language. And Ngugi Vationgo has written Decolonizing the Mind. He is saying that in African uh, universities, people are studying English literature like we are doing. And this has led to the, uh, the degeneration of African literature and culture. People have become more and more English oriented. Nobody is studying African literature and culture. So he wants to decolonize English departments. He wants to decolonize African mind. Ngugi Vatyongos, his novels are very famous. Uh, a, a Grain of Wheat, Weep Not Child, The River Between, Devil on the Cross, Matigari, etc. You have to read about them. Today what I am giving is a thorough map. Please read extra about all these writers if you are writing Ignu Entrance. Okay. Vole Soinga became the first African to win Nobel Prize. Vole Soinga has written uh, many plays. He is a very major playwright. He went into exile during the dictatorship of Sani Abacha, Robert Mugabe, etc. And Vole um, uh, Soinga has written uh, many plays that are all familiar to all of you, such as um, wait, uh, such as Lion and the Jewel, The Strong Breed, uh, Death and the King's Horseman, etc. Here he criticizes Nigerian culture also. He criticizes Nigerian culture uh, a lot in his plays. Vole Soinga has also written poetry. Everybody must be familiar with the telephone conversation. So works of Vole Soinga very very important. Then in Asian literatures they have prescribed Babsi Sidhwa but other Asian writers are also important. As you know I have done Asian literature in detail in our 10 p.m. sessions. So please take that PDF. Kalyani Vallad Asian literature if you google search also you will get probably. So Take it up and watch it again. Take that PDF and study it before the exam. Okay. So much I have already given. Babsi Sidhwa is well known for uh, Ice Candy Man then or otherwise called Cracking India, Water and uh, uh, many novels that depict uh, women's lives especially in uh, Asia and Pakistan and she is a Parsi writer also. Australian literature prescribed as Patrick White. His voice is very famous. He became the first Australian to win Nobel Prize. And Patrick White has written a large number of novels that are prescribed in universities. A Fringe of Leaves is prescribed. Tree of Man is prescribed. So read a little bit more about Patrick White. And also um, other Australian writers could be important. Like I said, all these I have dealt with in 10 p.m. live detailed. So just, uh, you know, Google search and revise everything. Pa Peter Carey, remember? Peter Carey's works, Bolo Sablog. Who, what are the works of Peter Carey? Bliss, his first novel, Illy Wacker. Then um, 
Oscar and Lucinda, True History of the Gelly Kelly Gang, Jack Mags, all very important. David Malouf, Thomas Kennelly, we have already talked about. In Canadian literature, Margaret Lawrence is prescribed, but Margaret Atwood, uh, Michael Ondache and uh, Alice Munro, etc. could also be very important. So please read about their books. They will expect you to read their books books and have some insight into the stories etc when you uh, write the exam remember to study like that and then we have diaspora studies diaspora studies is an academic field established in the late 20th century dealing with migration what are the impacts of migration cultural impact literary impact social demographic anthropological political economic so many uh, ways in which diaspora studies uh, impact on life international relations now everybody knows diaspora means what diaspora means uh, greek uh, scattering greek diaspora that is the term from which the word diaspora came a dispersed network of ethnically and culturally related peoples. <coughs> Diaspora studies means what? The study of the dispersed people and they are ethnically and culturally related. Then the use of the term diaspora to relates to, it has connotation of forced resettlement, deterritorialization first. You know, people lose land. They are, then they are forced to resettle. Do you, why? Because of expulsion, because of coercion, because of slavery it can be, racism, war. So many reasons are there for people losing their land and settling in other places, isn't it? So diaspora literature involves an idea of a homeland. All these people who are scattered are connected by an idea of a homeland. A place from where the displacement occurs. For example, if they are Indian diaspora, they get displaced from India. They have to undertake journeys, harsh journeys. They have to, they will have economic compulsions. They will be living in exile. They will be feeling alienated. All that is covered in diaspora literature. Then uh, there is a famous essay related to this by Stuart Hall. Will you please remember? This is a very important essay by Stuart Hall. Cultural Identity and Diaspora. Essay by Stuart Hall. They might ask you, remember. There are two kinds of diaspora. Classical diaspora and ethnoscapes. Classical diaspora means people are forcibly driven away from their homeland. People are forcibly driven away from their homeland like slavery. Because of slavery, people had to leave Africa. Because of religious persecution, people will have to leave their, leave their homeland, etc. So they will leave their homeland and they will take refuge in other countries. That is classical diaspora. What do you mean by ethnoscapes? Ethnoscape is defined by Arjun Appadure. It is one of the five scapes, isn't it? What do you mean by ethnoscapes? Transnational flow of people. Across nations, people are flowing in the age of advanced capital and globalization. In the age of advanced capital and globalization, people are flowing across nations. That is ethnoscape. Arjun Appadure. He is the person who defined it. Now, there are three moments in diaspora studies. You talk about pre-modern diaspora. Pre-modern is very early. In the early times in the Middle Ages, Renaissance period, etc. Diaspora was there. Then modern diaspora means during the age of colonialism, primarily for slavery, people were displaced. So modern diaspora. Postmodern diaspora is in the age of globalization. Hannah, did you understand everyone? Important authors or theorists include William Safran, Robin Cohen. Will you remember? I don't know how to pronounce this name, but when you see this name, remember diaspora studies. Even Paul Gilroy, who talked about Black Atlantic, he is also a diaspora critic. I will write Paul Gilroy also here, okay? Paul Gilroy. 
Okay. Next is diaspora studies concepts. This is Bahut Chota, na? Are you able to see? William Safran defined diaspora as one particular form of mass migration involving forced exile. If you are not able to see, I have one idea. William Safran defined diaspora uh, as one form of mass migration. Can you see now? This first part, can you see now? William Safran said, diaspora studies means studying about mass migration involving forced exile, lengthy period of settlement, resettlement. Hana? Diaspora consists of migrations. What kind of migrations does it consist of? Original communities have spread from the homeland to two or more countries. One kind of migration I am reading here. One kind of migration is original country communities have spread from the homeland to many countries. Like Indian diaspora. Hena? Indian diaspora is like that. Secondly, these communities are bound to their original location by a common vision. In Fiji, Philippines, uh, then Caribbean islands, we have Indians. They are not really Indians. They did not physically go from here. Their forefathers went from here. They are, ra they are racially Indians. They don't know anything about India. But they have a common vision, a memory or a myth about their homeland. That's all. They have never come here. They don't know our history or language. But they have heard stories. There is a myth of India that is uniting them with us. Are you following me everybody? Now, these communities harbor a belief that they will never be accepted by their hosts. These diaspora people think that the host country, that means England or America, will never accept them. They are always a little bit Indian because they are never accepted. They believe that they or their descendants will return to their homeland. Someday we will go back to India. Someday our children will go back to India. Like that they think. And they are interested in the affairs of India. They take a solidarity with Indians. They have a solidarity with Indians. This is the uh, kind of diaspora migration. Okay. These are all very important concepts in diaspora studies. Are dekho na. Robin Cohen identified five types of diaspora. Did you know that? There are victim diasporas, labor diasporas, trade diasporas, imperial diasporas, cultural diasporas. Sorry. Cultural diasporas. What are they? Victim diasporas means... People who are forced into exile, uh, slaves, etc. Jews are like that. Africans are like that. Labor diasporas means people going in search of work. Okay, people going in search of work. Many people, uh, many Indians went to Africa or Latin America or Caribbean islands like that. India, sorry, USA. Now, trade diaspora. Uh, you know, people seeking trade, uh, uh, Arabs, Chinese, Lebanese, etc. are like that. They do trade. Then imperial diasporas. Many people traveled to serve in the empire. To serve in the empire. That is why they traveled. Then cultural diaspora. They go because uh, of chain migration. You know, Caribbeans all emigrate to UK. Many Punjabis go to Canada. Did you understand? That is a cultural diaspora. Okay, because all our cultural, culturally all our people are there, we also go. Now, lastly, I will talk about folklore studies. The term folklore was established by William Thomas, a British man. Folklore. Uh, fa folklore is related to nationalism and patriotism. When a country undergoes nationalism and patriotism, then they will revive their folklore. Did you understand? The history of folklore studies began in the 19th century. The folklorist, what does the folklorist do? 
he studies the traditional artifacts of a group the folklorist studies the traditional artifacts of a group the folklorist study the groups within which customs traditions beliefs are transmitted how folklore studies how customs traditions are transmitted how beliefs are transmitted how traditional artifacts form part of a group did you understand and folklore studies is deeply connected with the nation every nation is connected with its folklore it is said to belong to the lower levels of social hierarchy it belongs to the poor people the lower social people it is old fashioned compared to complex metropolitan civilization it is mass you know it is a mass artifact it belongs to everybody and folklore uh, connects us through common traditions and a particular feeling of communication singing songs same songs are sung by everyone same dances we dance you know all that connects us they are common tradition and common communication getting me everybody some more only little more is there okay i'm sorry if i am boring you there are different types of folklore that you can study researchers study oral narratives folk poetry proverbs riddles folk speech crafts folk architecture folk costumes folk cookery folk medicine folk religion all these people study folk music dance drama folk narratology is there studying oral narratives remember vladimir prop studied folk tales for the first time morphology of the folk tale was studied by vladimir prop morphology of the folk tale he wanted to develop a grammar of narrative vladimir prop worked with russian folk tales he studied the narrative functions of folk tales you know he studied many stories many folk tales and found that they have common narrative functions the narrative functions of folk tales are like building blocks you know they follow the chronological order of a linear sequence they are like building blocks and prop compiled a list of 31 narrative functions pop compiled a list of 31 narrative functions and he identified seven character types the villain the donor the helper the princess and her father the dispatcher the hero the false hero like that he identified seven character types and 31 narrative functions folklore studies who are the important figures john lomax irving hallowell will you please google search extra please google search extra john lomax Irving Hallowell, Simon Bronner. We never heard, na? No problem. Abhi to sune. Now we have heard, and you can study uh, Alan Dundas and William Wilson. They are all folklore studies experts. Okay. So that brings us to the end of this session. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you got a lot of new ideas. If you read a little bit extra, you will be amazing scholars. tomorrow we will talk about uh, ignu m a entrance okay m a entrance is very easy we have already covered all that in M in our classes i will again talk about it okay guys i will talk about major exams like this okay uh, central university entrances we will talk about okay okay bye good night see you tomorrow i will post this pdf in the group telegram group just join the telegram group and take it every pdf is there in the files tab okay and remember my whatsapp number if you want to get the links whatsapp number is 9037357688 okay i have posted the whatsapp number so thank you bye bye whatsapp me if you